Welcome to Sacred Rebels Podcast, where we discuss life after trauma as we question societal norms and shatter stigmas. Are you a woman who longs for a sense of community and understanding? Well, stick around. There is a seat for you here. This is your host, Tay. And co-host, Amy. And we're just two best friend millennial moms and entrepreneurs navigating life and motherhood while on a spiritual healing journey. We don't do surface level, and we're definitely not your typical moms, so let's dig deep. We plan to cover it all and take you behind the scenes as we share our personal experiences, learn more about the holistic side of healing, and introduce all the incredible humans we've met along the way. Join us as we share the good, the bad, and the ugly side of healing. We hope to help you step into your power. Thanks so much for listening. All right, welcome back to another episode of Sacred Rebels. Tonight we have Jess here with us from Revive. Amy will introduce her after we start off with our big deep breath. One hand on the heart, one hand on the belly. Heart is our intuition, our gut is our wisdom. Take big deep breath into the nose. And then exhale, let that shit go. So I'm so honored and grateful to have Jess sitting here with us tonight. She is the director of Revive Recovery, which is a nonprofit that was, um, I helped start about seven years ago, right? Seven? Mm -hmm. Yeah. About seven years ago. And what it has grown and flourished into, I think is a key part of, you know, what Taylor and I talk about with it's just like all pathways to recovery and the specific center is more based upon, you know, addiction recovery and, and those things and all pathways. So it's so important. And um, Jess pulled a card and we're going to have her read a little cliff note from the card. And then we'll just talk about what Revive does. Perfect. So today I pulled follow your own rhythm. Deep within you, you are moved by an ancient powerful force that cannot be tamed. It is the rising pulse of your connection to the life force. You feel it in your bones, in your blood, in your heart, and in your belly. The oracle brings the special message that you cannot miss what you are destined for, nor will you gain anything by trying to push yourself. Your needs will be met in harmony with your own rhythms. All that you will miss out by trusting in this is anxiety. What you will gain is peace. So the healing process, say aloud. I now release any unhealthy attachment to the structures, routines, and belief systems of others that are preventing me from excess, accessing or and honoring my inner sacred rhythms. This Ooh. means you are now open to learning something new about your about loving yourself, and it will become easier with practice. Wow. Wow. <laughs> okay. Like, are they not spot on? I know. Like, is that not spot on? It's incredible. And how can you relate that card to your experience with Revive, Jess? <laughs> well, I can tell you that Revive's given me, like, the opportunity to, like, figure out what my own rhythm is and continue to, like, follow it. Um, I don't know if we should go, like, into what Revive is right away or more of just, like, any, um, you know, sounding block. And I feel like you know, a majority of people in recovery come upon like different steps along their recovery journey. And it looks different for everybody. Um, thank you. Yeah. Um, there's no like right or wrong way to do it. Um, and I feel like Revive is that for anyone who's pretty much come through our front doors, whether, you know, starting with our board of directors. Um, I think Revive's been a part of everyone's recovery journey, you know, should someone identify that way. Um, and then our participants, the ones we work with, you know, in drug court, the various drug courts we serve in Manchester and Nashua, um, our ACEs, mobile response teams, our youth, youth groups, youth alternative peer groups, um, other harm reduction programming out in the community. Um, we're pretty excited because this summer we're going to be looking at doing like intentional Narcan outreach, uh, engaging with folks um, who uh, engage in opioid use. Um, but we got some scooters to do it this year so we can like go down um, to all areas of Nashua, um, meet with people in encampments. Um, am I too close to this? Is this good? No, no, you're good. 
I've never done one of these microphones. No, 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 things. you're good. Besides on live radio, so. <laughs> <laughs> Killing um, it. So, yeah, the card that I pulled today definitely fits very much why I'm here today. Um, I've been very fortunate to have been given opportunities at Revive that kind of just really, mm, like, match who I am as a person. Um, I took Recovery Coach Academy before I started working at Revive, but the role that I was in at my former employer didn't really match up. I felt like I should be talking to people about recovery more. Um, and not just the mental health aspect, but like both of it, because it, to me, it just mm. goes hand in hand. Um, and so when I saw that, like an opportunity was, um, you know, open at Revive, I jumped on it right away. And it just one thing came right after another. We Two months after I started, we went live with the sauna, the harm reduction program. And then within six months after that, we began building relationships with the drug court program in Nashua. I think we should take a tiny, tiny pause and you should like say a little bit about yourself. <laughs> like, you know, what qual? I know Jess, you're important and you're so amazing. And like, <laughs> there's a reason why you stepped into this role. There's a reason why you stepped into this position. There's a reason why your passion is to help people the way that your passion is to help people. And that's because you have a story like you relate and like have a little bit of a situation, you know, just like a tiny bit of like mm -hmm. identify your struggles of like, why is your passion to be a director of a nonprofit? Because that's so beautiful, right? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's big. Um, <clears throat> well, I mean, I've kind of always just been built nonprofit, like cared more about um, the person than like, you know, any kind of financial gain or, um, you know, anything I could personally benefit from helping somebody else. Uh, and that started at a young age and kind of just carried me through, like, through sports. Um, you know, I, that uh, sports were often, like, my outlet, a uh, way to connect with others. Um, and, you know, uh, I hate talking about me as a person. I hate it. Like, <laughs> yeah. I just like talking about, like, what we do and stuff like that. But, um, you know, I identify as having a substance use disorder, so that means that, you know, life wasn't always as good as it is for me right now, but, um, you know, I've, I've been able to, like, learn what recovery means to me. Um, you know, I'm a, mom, I'm a mom today, and I'm able to show up for my kids. Incredible. And that's, like, to me, my recovery. Um, <clears throat> you know, and uh, I hate talking about myself, but, you know... Um, I often, you know, reached for substances because I felt like I didn't fit in, right? There was always, like, this part of me that didn't really know, like, I, f I kind of felt like a, like a round per like a round peg trying to fit in, in like, a square, a square hole. hole. Um, and, like, I can, even before substances were in, in the picture, that's, like, the root of, like, m m what my struggles were. Um, and, m you know, many can identify with that. Um, and, like that constant feeling of not fitting in eventually led to substances and then you know tr tragic losses in my life on top of what was already like you know uh, um, a struggle to to fit in um, it just became a way to escape yeah you know many of us um, have like great destinies but sometimes lose focus and uh, that's when we reach for substances so um, and then taking on too much yeah. <laughs> on top of that. Uh, another one of my character defects that eventually, you know, led to my demise. But I've also found ways in my life today that I can, like, utilize those negative things and kind of utilize it as a positive. Same. You know. I agree with that. Being able to find balance between, like, what I need to do for my own recovery, what I need to do for my job, what I need to do for my family um, is kind of just like how I'm able to survive today and why I continue to do the things that I do so I can help others try and identify that, um, try and come up with ways so that they're more successful in their lives, whether that be working in the field or just trying to get into recovery again. Um, and so that's why, you know, I'm here today, why I pulled that card, I think. <laughs> exactly <laughs> it's why. It's not your thing, honey. It's exactly why. And it's so important. And, you know, Jess is so humble. And 
um, you know, Revive has had a long journey over the past seven years. And when we originally opened, we didn't have a space and we were just doing paperwork and it was a ton of paperwork. And what Revive is, let's talk about that a little bit, is um, a New Hampshire started um, federal funding called for recovery organizations. It's the RCO, um, uh, what is it, initiative or whatever yeah. it was. There was 12 of them when it started seven years ago. Mm-hmm. And the idea was, uh, I guess the most popular one in New Hampshire is Hope, that everybody could kind of identify with. There's SOS in Do- uh, Dover. Hampton, Hampton, Dover, and Rochester is where SOS is. Yeah. yeah. And the, I got sober at the Dover SOS. Yeah, and then there's some in Keene, and they're in the White Mountains, and, and there's these 12, and, and now Jess says there's how many now? Because it started. 21 now. Tw- yeah. <laughs> yeah, incredible. And originally the grant was $120,000 to like start this center that was based upon all pathways of recovery and be a nonprofit where it could offer free services to, you know, a walk-in center. Mm-hmm. Just like a walk-in center to be able to provide Narcan and meetings and just you know, suboxone clinics and mat clinics and just literally all pathways because a lot of places and are just like one way, complete abstinent, you have to be abstinent, you have to go through detox, you have to do this thing. So they had this other idea, so they created this other program. Um, I was working in recovery at the time. I was working at the process and rise above in Nashua. Well, I'm sure at one point later on in our podcast we'll talk more about that, but that's, you know, how this came about. And we got the grant and we found the place and eventually, you know, we had like a few other directors before and, um, you know, it wasn't really growing and it was kind of just this, this thing, but we had Jess and Jess came in and she really like came in and put her passion and purpose to like help people into this program. And it's really evolved and developed. And I'd like just to talk about just like, She's like a trainer of CRSW, CRSWs, like recovery coaches, like I did my recovery coach, like there's like ethics training. So you could talk a little bit about maybe just how and like what you've done for the center as a whole in the past, what was it for? And the community. Yeah, the commu- the Nashua community. And now it's evolved to the dairy community and, mm-hmm. you know, the, the Milford community. And just, we've literally just, mm-hmm. it's you stepped in and it was like we just like came out like the lotus came out of the mud and we've just like flourished so much so much so that i i thought we were only at a ha- half of not only but from 120,000 i said to her well i think we're like at a half a million dollars in grants a year and she just was said we're at what we're almost at a million a year yeah and well, grants and yeah. federal funding like that's amazing yeah it's incredible yeah, we've grown a lot over the years. Um, when the operating budget was about one hundred and twenty thousand a year when I first started, um, but how long t- ago was this? This was in 2017, okay. 2018. Uh, so twenty eighteen was when I started there. So it, we started growing probably more closer to twenty nineteen, um, and so we've just taken on new uh, contracts with the drug courts, uh, with our ACEs mobile response team that serves. Um, so anytime there's an overdose in which children are present, uh, one of us from Revive and then a clinician from the children's department at Greater Nashua Mental Health, um, one of them and then one of us will respond to the scene within an hour. Um, For the child, not just the right the person overdosing. Yeah, it's such a beautiful program. Yeah, right. it's incredible. Mm-hmm. I didn't know that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So we do that in Nashua. We offer it in Hudson as well. Um, and then uh, in Milford, we have an ACERT uh, team that goes out every other week with Milford PD. Uh, it's broader, though, so that's substance use, but also other um, ACEs uh, incidents such as, like, domestic violence, child mm-hmm. abuse, neglect, yeah. stuff like that. Um, and so we go out and do that and we're able to engage with folks, um, let people know about our youth alternative peer group. So that's our group for youth ages 12 through 25 that are either directly or indirectly impacted by substance use. So it's sometimes helpful for like family members or like, um, kids of individuals who engage, uh, but sometimes it can act as more of like a preventative, um, we get some youth like 
engaging in cannabis use that, you know, their parents are worried it could lead to something else. Sometimes they're drinking on top of it. So it's just a good way to get kids together in a healthy environment. We tend to keep that group like funner with like activities like going to Canopy Lake or playing cornhole, stuff like that, like more hands on stuff. Um, so you hear if you're in the Nashua area and you have a child that's struggling, those, you know, we pay for the canopy trips like we, mm-hmm. with, with our grants and those kinds of things. So the kids are able to show up and it's for free. Like everything mm-hmm. that we do, everything, every service we provide is, you know, provided for through the grants that we get through our grant writers and those kinds of things. So it's mm-hmm. the family support and that's groups. so important. Like kids mm-hmm. just need connection they need fun things like healthy things to do I think that's where I went wrong and not feeling alone because here they go here these kids go and they're like whoa your parents are this way too or like you're struggling with this thing too and like struggling and like not wanting to do those things and make those decisions but like that's the only thing that every other child is doing right so they're like peer pressured and they're like well, wait a minute, there's this other group of kids that, like, actually doesn't want to do these things and are making active changes to, like, try and feel not alone. Yes. Mm. Mm-hmm. Um, there's several resources for kids that we connect with, either, you know, providing that you direct youth alternative peer group, but we'll also go to uh, Camp Mariposa, which is run out of the Boys yep. and Girls Club of yep. Greater Nashua. And so that's a camp that runs, um, I think there's one weekend every month where these kids go to get to go overnight to this like stay away camp where they have like a clinician on site and they do like really deep like um, learning about yourself. Um, so these kids are directly impacted by substance use and I've had you know conversations with a handful of them and it seems like a lot of them are drinking and like using some drugs Um, and so it's just a way for them to continue to connect and like learn and um, build build life skills to be better you know Um, and just deal with stuff that they have going on at home how to show up in society yeah Mm -hmm. so we get to do lots of fun stuff like that Um, that must be tough is that tough for you no, I love it. <laughs> I feel like That's I would. That's the fun part. I feel like know? I would get so attached. I feel like that would be so hard for me. It's well, like Allie at my turn. I'm gonna have Allie, who's like my turn in Manchester, mm-hmm. where it's like, and Taylor works there. I'm sure Taylor's gonna talk about my turn um, when we record with her. But uh, yeah, like it's it's rewarding because you're seeing these kids like connect, and you're like, you know mm. what they're going home to, yeah. and they're choosing to come to these places instead of like choosing that you know what I mean Mm -hmm. they're seeing the light they're seeing people like Jess they're seeing people like Priscilla and people that are running these groups that are like wanting them Mm -hmm. they're wanting them to come I guess that's true you know who runs the groups the the youth group over there um, so it's Priscilla and Molly um, mm-hmm. that typically are the ones to lead that group. There's been uh, periods of time where we've had youth that like had these leadership skills that just jumped right in and wanted to run the group themselves. Mm. And we let them for a period of time. But then, you know, they're um, at that age that is the time where you do a lot. Of, you're looking at employment stuff. You're looking yeah. at education stuff. Some of them have gone back to school. Some of them got full time jobs and are, you know, working and stuff. So there's, you know, there's been uh, some time where they've had we've had these leaders and they've had to step down but like it's kind of like a sad like a happy sad goodbye you yeah, know yeah. because um you know you want them to stay but you also recognize that at that age like you need to be taking steps in a certain yeah, direction yeah. so if they're taking them you know we send them on their way and hope that they come back to us again um and then so kind of what goes hand in the hand with like the youth and um the youth groups that we have. We also offer like a parenting program. Uh, So there's two of them that we offer. One's nurturing families and then the other one's parenting journey and recovery. Um, And they're both like two different uh, curriculums that will follow. um, uh, Great for individuals working in the drug courts or even um, in any kind of diversion program um, because it gives them like a way, like you learn life skills again while coming together with other people in recovery and also helps you look at like how you were parented um as being like what has led you to your recovery journey you know as uh, many of us are familiar with um so we are looking at offering that group um we're currently doing at the cynthia day family center in nashua 
Um, but we're going to be looking at offering that inside the jails as well uh, to inmates of the Hillsborough County South. Uh, no, I'm sorry, Hillsborough County House of Corrections. They have all these acronyms that I always have to remember. So. <laughs> That's Valley Street. Valley Street. It's yes. Valley Street. Valley Street. For those of you that don't know it, it's Valley Street. <laughs> Which I'm so excited because I really I'm gonna bring sound in. Like that's mm-hmm. my goal is I'm gonna be in there with Revive and I'm gonna bring my sound bowls into Valley Street. That's good. They need mm-hmm. it. Yes. I've heard some. Valley Street's not great. Yeah, Been not there so great things times. about Valley Street. Mm. One of my really good friends' sister committed suicide in there. Yeah, there's a lot like, of suicide in Valley Street. It was like a big Street. deal. It was like a big deal a couple mm. years ago. Her parents are like in the middle of trying to sue Valley Street because she was supposed to be on suicide watch. It's like a whole thing. Yeah, there was that. There was a situation within the last seven days that happened there that too. Another one. Yeah, it happens a lot there. It's, it's fucking sad. It's a private jail. Where here we are, like back. We can go off on a tangent <laughs> on the patriarchy and like the <laughs> ruler of all the things. Which is why it's so important for a revive to be able to go in there. Exactly. Yeah. Folks. Mm-hmm. Exactly. So that they're not continuing to have to go back in there. Exactly. Yeah, because that's what happens, right? Like people are always like, oh, why do they go to jail and then they get right out? Well, it's because they're going to jail and they're not getting any services. They're not learning how to heal mm-hmm. themselves. They're not having any tools. They've just yeah. sit in jail. They met more criminals. Yeah. They've met more things. And then they get out and they haven't used in months because they've been in jail. And then they think their tolerance is the same. And then you get out and then you, you, you know, you die, you overdose. Or you don't know that there's places like Revive that exist because mm-hmm. nobody's telling yeah. them in there. Yeah. There's, yeah. there's nobody. Yep. And nobody knows that you could, there's literally like a walk-in center that you could walk in, get connected with a recovery coach, get free services, help build your resume, mm-hmm. sit on a computer, learn how to do life skills. People just show up for you and like yeah, that's for free, mm-hmm. for free. Yeah. They just show it for you for free. They, mm-hmm. Their heart and their passion is in this so deeply that a lot of our, our volunteers, a lot of our, you know, our, our staff is volunteers that it's like moms who have lost their children and they mm-hmm. come in and they just want to give their life to like helping people. people. It's so oh, beautiful. I could literally cry. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, we're grateful for these different things that we get to do out in the community. Um, or how about the, you know, giving clean needles and supply, yes. like, you know, that's, that's so important. Like we, yeah, we can have this, you just need to stop and like, you know, <laughs> don't do, you know what I mean? Whatever. Complete just abstinence. Just say no but, to drugs. Yeah. <laughs> oh, cool. But, yeah. <laughs> okay. So no we know how work. that works. Yeah. <laughs> so when just say no doesn't work, there's harm reduction. <laughs> um, so I, like I mentioned, two months after I started at Revive, we went live with the sauna program. So that's the Syringe Service Alliance of the Nashua area, SSINA, but we say it like sauna. Uh, just because it rolls off the tongue nicely. Um, And so that's a comprehensive harm reduction program. When we started it, we weren't necessarily like the fiscal agent. We were like in charge of the outreach workers, getting the volunteers, charge of training people. Um, And then in 2021, um, the fiscal agent who was the Southern New Hampshire HIV AIDS task force decided that they no longer wanted to like get grant funding or be the one to like kind of coordinate the program. And we didn't want to lose the program, um, mm. as much as like, I didn't want to take on, um, this like program that, um, is part of revive, but like funding is tricky. So in the state of New Hampshire, you can't use federal or state funds to purchase any syringes. Um, and when we started, we were just a syringe service program. We've expanded since. Um, <laughs> what? Well, Joe Biden passed the law where it's expanded, <laughs> yeah. and it's expanded to. It's, we're going to talk about it. You, we give out neon like spoons for clean sniffing and mm-hmm. boofing kits. Clean boofing kits, because <laughs> Joe Biden thought that that was. <laughs> Wait, boofing as in like soaking tampons and well, sticking well, them in your asshole? Is that what we're talking about here? So, I mean, you is can't. that not boofing? <laughs> is that That's not the boofing? old clean, dirty way of doing it? Now we provide a clean. Yeah, you use a syringe, so it's like a a, a needle, but you it, or a syringe, but it doesn't have the, the metal needle tip. tip. Yeah, so you can use that and insert it into yes, your Yes, Joe rectum. Biden. Oh, my fucking word. I'm, Joe Biden. I'm really, you know, I'm really, this is, you know. If not, any of you all saw my meme the other day, I was like. 
But I mean, <laughs> whatever, too. right? Like it, it. Right. We were able to get it gives up chapstick and alcohol wipes yeah. and like there's other things that's like a part of it. But the whole joke a few like years ago or what was it last year about the crack pipes? Like mm-hmm. that's another thing that we like give out. But it is about sanitary and clean and mm-hmm. like yeah, people, people not getting diseases, diseases and spreading diseases and you know we can laugh about all these things but in reality like all of these things are happening so yeah. if we can mm-hmm. provide a safe place and this is the tricky thing right here we go like there's like always a reason so the goal is is that these people are coming mm-hmm. and they're seeing Jess and these same faces show up on a consistent basis and we're not just giving out the things you're giving out information you're giving out like hey you're not alone anymore mm-hmm. like we're here we're showing yeah. up for you we're giving you these things and like how many people come now to you guys through that service and yes. get yeah. well we have multiple staff members actually who first engaged with us through our syringe service program now which yeah. is it's pretty cool to say because yes. now that we've been doing it for like five six or so years um people have you know come through that and like taken those steps to be in recovery and are now wanting like, to, to help a, people uh, yes exactly we're del- it's basically we're taking a public health approach with this um i don't know i mean you're familiar we live in new hampshire and you know president trump said that we're a drug infested den yeah. so yeah. as we know the drugs are already being used like Mm -hmm. and just say no didn't work and it's not going to work when someone's addicted chemically dependent on an opiate or anything else that's being cut in it nowadays um and so when we're able to give someone like an opportunity to use something in a safer way because i don't know if you're familiar but smoking something is actually safer than injecting it yeah and so i can be like hey and then i'll give you as many safer snorting kits as you want because that's even safer than smoking so we can help people You know, when we first meet them, they're engaging in, you know, injection. So they're getting like lots and lots of syringes. Okay, so is there a way that maybe we can talk about me giving you this pipe so that you can smoke it and then you're not going to be using as many syringes? So now by next week, I can maybe cut the amount of syringes that I'm giving you in half if you start using this pipe half the time stuff like that and then eventually we can get them down to a place of maybe considering recovery but like maybe that's not something they want there's people that have um chronic health conditions that is going to keep them using substances for the rest of their lives we've had people with diabetes call our program because they can't afford their syringes right now and their insurance is not covering it Mm -hmm. we're able to help those folks too it's not just about wow that's incredible yeah yeah, um, and like we have testing, we have safer sex kits, like four different kinds of lube, because you know people who engage in sex work are probably using that on a frequent basis. You know, so yeah. why not give them something to do it safer and protect themselves? So yeah, to the average person, if you're listening to this, you're probably hearing this and you're probably like, wow, like that's crazy, like you know. But to someone who's lived it and who knows this life, it's if I would have known about these resources or these things a lot sooner, maybe I would have realize the opportunity that I had to get help or the people that even just wanted to help me Mm -hmm. um, and and would have had a safer way because I was that one who ended up with hep C because I was using dirty needles you know Mm -hmm. absolutely and there's treatment available nowadays like yeah I got the treatment Mm -hmm. once I got sober so we're able to like engage people in that conversation and be like, yes, you can be cured of this. You are worth a healthy body. You know, let's talk about ways to get you there. Um, so two days a week, the city's health department actually comes out with us too. And they can provide testing like right there on site in the van that they'll pull up like right next to ours. So like you can come over here, get the supplies you need. And then if you want to get tested while you're here, you can. And then, you know, should something come up, the outreach workers from the city are able to get them hooked up Mm. with whatever kind of medications or treatments or referrals that are needed right in that moment um it's a great it's like a lot of people's first entry into like making smarter healthier choices for themselves like we are giving out sunscreen during the summer we're giving out um like heat heat packs like hand warmers Mm -hmm. for people we're giving out tents we're giving out um sleeping bags blankets like just essentials that like people might be able to get somewhere else but maybe not um so um and like even if we can't provide something we're able to find something within the community that people might need like say somebody does want to go into treatment we're able to make phone calls right then and there and potentially arrange i mean i've had people picked up same day before um because we know like in that moment 
people are that desperate like you have to act then yeah you can't wait oh come see us tomorrow yeah. Yeah. We'll, we'll make the phone calls it's no let's make the phone calls right now right here and let's do it and that's what a lot of people I feel like don't realize too like you know I spent years and years working in the treatment facility in New Hampshire has such limited resources like we would have to like tell people to like say that they were suicidal and go to Massachusetts because Mass Health has so much mm -hmm. more state services New Hampshire has a lack of services like and the homeless population is that like there isn't there I mean some of them yes there's like mental illness and things a lot of people are choosing that and you know that's fine but there are so many people that don't have the resources and mm. New Hampshire doesn't have resources I was one of those people like I didn't have insurance like I was homeless like mm -hmm. I had to get a my first detox experience was at Serenity in Manchester on the east side I literally we were in bunk beds I got no detox meds I got ibuprofen and water if you were having seizures you had to be on the bottom bunk like I went to I had to go to the hospital like it was it, the lack like not still like mm -hmm. there is no I mean when hope was doing their hope detox there was just people on mats in the floor like <laughs> just like it, it it's just like the the limited amount of resources is why I feel like so many more people would get well and have this opportunity if the resources were greater yeah mm -hmm. and or the way they they're treated, treated people well I was just yeah treated people like treated. fucking humans mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah we have people that would prefer to sleep out in tents than deal with how they would be treated, treated either in. in a in a hospital or in a shelter or in uh, some transitional yeah, sober living like not okay. facilities. I know, I know. Um, They're dehumanized. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's fucked up. We're all human. Like, mm -hmm. I know. Um, I mean, the stigma associated with substance use disorder in general. I mean, it's so hard for individuals, which is, um, you know if if you're identify as having a substance use problem like it's already so hard to speak out and like um you know reach out and get help when you want it so like to have to like deal with the provider or the burnt out person that might not want to you know deal yeah. with your shit that day on top of it you know um we've we've had to transport people all over this state to get help um you know those 4 p.m on a friday no one's answering nobody's got beds nowhere but i mean we've reached out and we found them uh, for people in times of need uh, we've had to gr get creative and like hand deliver people ourselves to different emergency rooms all over the state but um, I know there's a huge lack of resources in this state you compare it to other states around us that have like millions of millions of dollars in reentry services or um, you know different opportunities for folks that like some of them like we don't have anything for youth in in the state nothing for youth Nothing good. <laughs> and my goal and, Dude, and what me and Jess is my, nothing. There is not a single adolescent. There's a couple of masks. I'm actually probably going to get connected with one in mass to do sound baths. But um, our biggest homeless population right now is aged out foster children, like p kids that turn 18. Mm -hmm. And they've been in the foster care system their entire life. And because they're in the foster care system, they don't have parental guidance and they don't have guidance. So they come out and they have no life skills, no nothing. And they're just like, give them this book. It's like this life skills book. And they're oh like, here you go, like, go figure it out, go have oh fun. God. So something that me and Jess are working on is potentially making like an intermediate home where we can like help them build resumes and have a place like a transitional home for them to get Yeah, when you told me the other, life the, the other day, I was like, I didn't even know that was a thing. And there's like, a ton of shit. grants. There's like millions of dollars in grants but nobody wants to do it nobody mm -hmm. wants to do this work nobody that's it's like there's how there's what tw you said 22 recovery centers 21 21 but you know it's still like not a lot and those people they're always looking we're always looking for employees we're always mm -hmm. looking for people to do this work because it's not you're not paid well but you know, and, and let's what just I've, put that plug in right now. Then, if you're listening to this, and this is something that you that you feel resonates with you, or that is calling to you, like reach out to Amy, reach out to Jess, get connected with Jess, like volunteer, mm -hmm. maybe employment. Take the training. Yeah, so take the trainings. the trainings. Like this is a perfect oh. opportunity yeah, to get involved the into the community. Yeah. Go ahead, Jess. So Jess is a boss. She like did her CRSW training, and now she's like a trainer of getting trainers. CRSWs. Yeah. Yes. 
So um, in the state of New Hampshire, um, for somebody who's looking to work as a recovery support worker or work in the field, um, the, you would you can take trainings to become a CRSW. So um, CRSW is a certified recovery support worker. It's a certification through the New Hampshire Board of Licensing. Um, and so there's trainings that someone would need to take, and we offer those. So I went through them, and that's when I, it, I really had that aha moment that this was something that I wanted to do um, and then I um, so um, we, we offer these trainings now um, over the years the titles have changed with new updated material and so the one that we do now is called the art and science of peer assisted recovery um, and we're actually offering that in two weeks it, we're partnering with um, the addiction recovery coalition of New Hampshire which is in Milford New Hampshire and so we're going to be training that um, April 17th through 21st, um, and there's an Eventbrite link that you can find um, on our website, or you even can call and find out more details. Um, and I'll then plug the website too on cool. the post when I post this. Sweet. So and there is a it. cost to those trainings, but I do believe that we like offer scholarships and mm -hmm. stuff too for people. Like if you're, you know, in recovery and you maybe like it's something that you wanted to do, or like a mom and like maybe you don't have enough money, but it's like something you really want to do on your free time, but money might be an obstacle. It's also something that you know we, you know, don't let money be an obstacle. Right. Um, I didn't have to pay for my training, so I often like to find ways for other people to not have to pay exactly, yeah. so that um, they can what have is an opportunity. The cost, just out of curiosity. Um, so there's four trainings in total that are needed, and so like the if you buy like all four trainings, it's like three hundred and fifty dollars. Okay. Um, the one week training is like two hundred, and then ethics, which is a two day training, is like a hundred or a hundred and fifty, and then the one day HIV training is usually fifty, and then the one day suicide prevention training is also another fifty dollars okay um yeah and so um if you take all four trainings you can like go through the certification process to become a crsw okay um there's other stuff like an, a test and a background check stuff like that that you would have to do but um i often recommend that folks tr if the if you're interested or think that you might like working in the field take the trainings to see if you like it and then you know look to either volunteer or you know a lot of times there's plenty of openings in the field yeah uh especially right now so you could take the training see if you like it and then look to you know try actually working in the field um and then you can work towards all the other stuff to get the actual certification cool. after that mm -hmm. cool and so um, what do you think, Jess? What is, if there's, like, one main thing, like, out to the world, like, that you're, like, the most passionate about, like, that Revive does, and, like, this is it for you, like, your moment, like, what could you share that you're just, like, wholeheartedly, like, why you're in Revive, why you chose Revive? Because you were not going to choose Revive. We almost lost her. We were, like, really sad, and she was going to go, which is stressful. Story. It's, it's <laughs> stressful. The job is stressful. Anything in nonprofit is stressful, and yeah. the clientele yeah. is stressful. I mean, anything in the recovery mm -hmm. community is stressful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, she's just such a boss that people were trying to take her from us. <laughs> um, so if there was one thing that Revive is, is that what you were saying? Or, or like just the, to you, to, like, to you, like as a woman, like as a boss, like as a director, like you in, you're in that role and you've grown our company from a very small nonprofit mm -hmm. to a million dollars in grants, Jess. Like almost a million dollars in grants. Yeah, it's incredible. Like, <laughs> it is so powerful and so incredible. And like, yes, we, we as a board of directors support you and like do the things that we need to do, but like, you do the work, like you chose Revive, like you chose this as like your passion project mm -hmm. and give everything that you have, like as a woman, even as a mother of two, like going through a wedding, like, you know what I mean? Like you've mm -hmm. done all of these things, you've grown yeah. so much as a person in Revive, mm -hmm. as a woman and really stepped into this power and into this role and like have just flourished. You have, I've watched it, it's been so beautiful, like flourished into like being a mom mm -hmm. and like a wife and, no. and a boss, mm -hmm. you're a boss, you're in charge of a whole center and it goes and flows and yeah, of course there's like things that happen, right? Yeah. But like you've had employees that have stayed with you for a long time, like mm -hmm. you've built women up, like the a lot of our clientele, a lot of our volunteers have become employees now and they're you know successful and mm -hmm. thriving mm -hmm. and like you you know you've been the vessel to be able to do that so like 
I guess it's um, like just never give up on yourself. Um, I love that. Uh, Amy talked about there was a time where I thought I was leaving Revive um, and it wasn't because I didn't like Revive or it wasn't very much a part of who like I am as a person. It was just because I couldn't handle the stress and what I was forgetting was that like I was completely in control of all of that Mm -hmm. Um, and it, it took like literally like I was supposed to leave and then just didn't. Um, it took me like getting to that, pushing it to like that point where I should have even already been gone to realize that like, if I was too stressed and I was not focused and if I wasn't felt like I wasn't doing a great job at my job, which is at the end of the day, what the root of all of that was, it was because of myself and the only person that could change, make any changes or do anything about it was me. I had like Amy and like other board members, people in the community that were like, what can I do? Like, how are we going to fix this? Um, like, um, and, and like there was, I couldn't like give anything to be done. Um, and I was actually, I think I was like just in a coffee shop downtown, like a week or two before I was supposed to leave. And I ran into one of my old teachers, um, who was like now, like, so she was a teacher of mine back in middle school, high school. Um, and then she works in prevention now and does like a lot of stuff in the schools, but just doesn't teach anymore. Um, and I think, I don't know if she knew she, if that, like she heard I was leaving or not, but she like gave me this whole talk about like, you know, how one time she thought she was going to leave this job and, you know, she, um, like had, she made her, she changed her mind last minute and then she just has been like, so like happy and grateful like ever since Mm. and um I don't know if the story was intentional it might have been but it hit me and then a couple other things happened within that that last seven days that I was supposed to leave and I was just like I can't walk away from this I'm not ready yet yeah um I know that like I'm gonna go back to school and this like you know I'm still gonna continue to grow as an individual and I think Revive is very much gonna continue to be a part of that for a while Um, but I know that I'm not done yet and I know that um, there's still like populations that I'm not reaching like with my own personal um, like background and different Mm. things that I've been through Um, so like I think education more education is definitely in the works for me I don't know what it is yet Um, it's going to probably happen with the next couple years doesn't mean I'm leaving a revive I think I just want to come up with ways to continue to grow Um, and it might include like a little bit more clinical work and stuff Um, that isn't something that I've you know really done a lot in the past Um, but I know that revive has a bigger and even brighter future and I know that I do too so Mm. I plan on us both going the same direction for a while that's awesome awesome. (laughs) only up from here baby that's what I keep saying yeah Mm -hmm. it's so beautiful only up only up Mm um yeah so I think I'm so grateful Revive is in Nashville. It's right on Main Street. It's right across from Southern New Hampshire Hospital if you're ever you know in the area you could pop by check it out we are always looking for donations for clothes. There's yes. a um, we prov- there's like a shower in there if people need to shower. There's a all kinds of clothes that mm-hmm. you know if people are looking need like job interviews or mm-hmm. you know so if you have those kinds of clothes and you you don't need them we're always looking for donations. Mm-hmm. We have events. We have a, a page that you could just donate. We mm-hmm. you know all we do is give back. That is yeah that Mm -hmm. is the goal and so we'll we'll link the website to this podcast and um we'll just keep an ear out is there anything else that you want to say to the listeners to the listeners before we close it up um no just i guess if you know anyone that's struggling don't hesitate to reach out Mm -hmm. um we are available we have a a phone line that is available 24 7 um a website you can check out for any events or activities on on the horizon um also our most updated center schedule with different meetings that happen right at the center um and then we're also um as Amy mentioned serving dairy and we're going to be there full time uh, within the next couple of weeks. We are there from 11 to 3 each day, but um, that location's at 6 Railroad Ave. Um, and then in Nashua, we're at Is 263. Is that the Friendship Center? The yes. Dairy yeah. Friendship Center. Mm-hmm. At the Dairy Friendship Center. Um, and we serve drug courts, the mm-hmm. Nashua Drug Court, Manchester Drug Court, Rockingham yes. County Drug Court. Um, 
Yes. And then we're going into the jails. Um, and then also looking at building relationships in Merrimack as they're looking to provide a harm reduction program and um, an ACEs program out there as well. So the we, children. we're looking at expanding, <laughs> oh, okay. continuing to grow. And youth, that, that's so important if you have I know, children. This is like, or I feel like this has program. sparked something in me. I want to work with youth. <laughs> I swear. Like, that's so important to me. Like, I wish I mm-hmm. had someone to work with me at that age, truly. Right. Because mm-hmm. I feel like my life probably would have taken a completely different turn. <laughs> well, I say it all the time. It's way easier. And, you know, this is just my experience working in recovery, that it is way easier to catch somebody from the age of 18 to 25 to have a life changing experience, to have a successful adult. Because sometimes once you get past that age of like in your 30s and you're trying to get like society's idea of like, where you're supposed to be at Mm. in your 30s and you're like not there yet, it's like way more difficult Mm -hmm. for people to achieve complete, you know, recovery or healing or whatever it is because they're just so blocked off, so stuck in their ways. And and then they're just the mental block. Mm -hmm. Kids still, you know, 18 to 25, they're fully not, they're- They're still impressionable. Well, their frontal cortex isn't completely developed yet, so we can still have the time to rewire and help them, like, prove that they can still have a new way of life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much for coming. Thank you. We really, really appreciate it. Mm -hmm. I can't wait for everyone to hear this. I hope hope you get tons of reach-outs from this. (laughs) I really do. I hope everyone listening. um, On both ends, like, people that are needing help and people that want to volunteer. volunteer. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, is what I was talking about, the volunteering. I hope we have lots of reach outs and people who want to volunteer or just close, like she said, close resources, anything that you could give, donations. Tents, sleeping yeah. bags. Yeah. Any yeah. donations yes. and stuff. We'll take all of that stuff and we'll get it out to people in the community. Um, definitely the uh, – we our needs right now are more of like the basic like underwear, bras, socks. Okay, um, good to know. Like – um, I mean, sweatpants or even um, like job ready clothes. So I like to have that stuff up in the attic so that, you know, people coming in trying work to boots. work boots. Yes. Yeah. Lots of people work in construction. Um, that high vis colors are always something that people will take, especially this time of year with the what landscape. Is it? Uh, high, uh, like, so like the neons. Heights. Neons. Oh, 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 high yes. visibility. Okay. <laughs> um, this time of year, people, I mean, you got the construction people, but then you also have uh, landscaping companies so yeah. that are getting up and running. And we actually have some recovery-friendly workplaces that we work pretty closely with. Um, so some of them are landscaping companies so cool. that um, we can get people like job, like jobs, whether that be get well jobs or even like actual like career jobs is what we nice. like to help people. Yeah, with. that's another organization we work with, Recovery Friendly Workplace, which is mm-hmm. like you as a company become a recovery friendly workplace and you get grants to help pay your payroll, mm-hmm. right? Um, yes. Kind of? So the rec- the advisors can like help come up with like different tax incentives mm-hmm. for like for profit companies. Um, we do work with nonprofits too, which wouldn't. I mean, you don't pay taxes, yeah. so how would you have a write off when you yeah, yeah, yeah. paying taxes? But um, there's different incentives based on like what the agency looks like. So there would be stuff like that. There's trainings that they provide to like employees, um, and it's just like getting creating a work. Uh, workplace where there's retention where there's workplace wellness leads to better outcomes for the company and for the individual Mm -hmm. so um depending on the type of uh company it is there would be different benefits Mm. such as that yes yeah Mm -hmm. all the things amazing yeah (laughs) check out our website super grateful to have jess here good thank you so much we'll link all the things and we will end the same way we start one hand on the heart one hand on the belly we'll breathe it all in and let it go thank you so much for listening for being present hope you all heal thank you thank you thank you thank you thanks so much for taking the time out of your busy schedule to listen to what we have to say it means the world as always we want to end this episode by reminding you that we are not medical professionals and we are not giving any type of medical advice we are simply sharing our experience and solutions We are here with the intentions of reminding you that you are never alone and that everyone's healing journey is unique to the individual. Make sure to follow us on all social media platforms to stay updated. Stay well, Sacred Rebels. See you next time.